So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to our web talk, Russian Imperialism for Dummies, Why Eastern Europe Gets Russia and Germany Doesn't. I'm Patrick Waltz, the head of the state office um, for Hessen and Rhineland Palatinate of the Civic Foundation, uh, Civic Education Department of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. And I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Frank Blechschmidt, the chairman of the Karl Hermann Flasch Foundation. I'm glad that the provocative title has lured so many of you in front of the screen. Um, at this uh, nice um, August evening. And I'm also glad that we have a very, um, really a, 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 pa a panel packed with expertise sitting here at different screens to tackle the, the question, why did Germany uh, mess up so badly, especially in contrast to the Eastern European states who warned, okay. I hope, yeah, this is fitting for the topic. Uh, and you're hearing the sirens perhaps behind me, that's some drill. And um, so, so, the, um, so the question is, why did Germany botch it up so much and why didn't it listen? This is also a, a good question. And, um, well, sorry, this really is uh, unsettling. And the, um, so, We'll skip right ahead, and I'm glad that we have experts from all over Europe here. First of all, we have Dr. Christy Wright from the International Center for Defense and Security in Estonia. She's the director um, of the Foreign Relations Institute. Dr. Reich, I'm very happy and glad that you have joined us this evening. Then we have Dr. Jana Fix, the program director from the Kova Foundation. Good to have you, Dr. Fix. And Edward Lucas, um, he's a former uh, fellow of the Norman Stiftung, or uh, he has a scholarship, and um, he's now still active uh, in the liberal family. He's uh, a candidate for the liberal Democrats in the cities of Westminster and London, a fellow at SIPA, and what's more relevant to this evening, he was uh, a journalist covering Eastern Europe and especially the Baltic states for 30 years and um, continues to have his watchful eye on the events there. Mr. Lucas, it's also great to have you here. And the evening will be moderated by Dr. Christoph von Marshall. He's the journalist at the newspaper Der Tagesspiegel. He's the chief dip diplomatic correspondent. Before that, he used to be the White House correspondent and he also wrote his thesis in Eastern European Studies. So he's also uh, in more than one um, aspect, uh, highly qualified to keep this discussion on track so that after one hour, we know more about, um, well, Germany's shortcoming and how Eastern Europe was able to get a better view on Russia and what Germany might learn and especially how this knowledge that exists can be infused into the German public debate and perhaps the political uh, circles. Now, um, I'd like to add one or to give you one little sneak preview. On the 13th of September, we will have a, another English web talk with Dr. Volodymyr Yamolenko. Uh, on decolonizing Dostoevsky. And we will have a look at the Russian classics and um, how Russian imperialism from the 19th century transpires through this work, because a lot of Germans have, are very fond of these classics and it might give them an opportunity to read them again and read them with a different perspective. So on the 13th of September, if you like Russian literature, and if you want to know more about um, the mindset behind that. So um, then if you want to ask questions, you can do so via the um, FNA, or not frequently asked questions, or the question and answer button. And we will try to tie them in, um, in, the, in the last part of the discussion. And now Dr. von Marshall, I'd like to hand over to you. And I wish, um, well, uh, do your best. I'm really looking forward to this um, panel and this web talk. And um, well, let's see 
what we will learn. Thank you, Patrick. Warm welcome also from me. And um, warm uh, thank you again for this really thought-provoking title, Russian Imperialism for Dummies, which certainly caught the attention of a uh, lot of uh, our uh, guests here. And um, we are want to explore a little bit, uh, do a review of Germany's relations with Russia over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, this includes, of course, the time before 2014, which was the year uh, with the annexation of Crimea and the start uh, of um, the hybrid war, as we call it, in Eastern Ukraine. Then the time 2014 to February 24th, the day when Russia attacked, which came to a lot of Germans as a surprise. And also the time after the Russian attack, to which degree Germany adapted, you all know this famous word Zeitenwende, to which degree has Germany changed? Um, are we now on a better uh, path? Um, are we aware of dangers and dependencies in the case of Ukraine and Russia, and as, as the case for Russian gas, for example, but also if we look uh, at the unfolding crisis around Taiwan, are we better prepared um, in a case that this crisis turns into a war and are we looking at our dependencies here and there. You could hear uh, or understand that Patrick um, shows emotions uh, when we come to the subject of the day and the evening. Uh, he's angry, he is disappointed um, by German policies, Russia policies over the recent decades. And as I said, we want to review them a little bit. We have three different perspectives. This is not a tribunal where our guests from Estonia and uh, the UK uh, have the role um, that they would uh, criticize and attack Germany. And then poor Liana Fix uh, would have the role to defend uh, German policy. It is rather an exploration. Uh, what uh, went wrong, uh, at what time, at what time Germany made maybe wrong decisions. And of course, uh, since since Patrick also um, asked why Eastern European gets Russia and Germany does not, I would like to start with Christy, that she gives us her perspective uh, from uh, Estonia, would continue with uh, Edward and then, then ask Liana. We will continue the conversation here at the panel uh, for the next, uh, let's say, uh, 30, 35 minutes. But I would really ask uh, the audience to early think about the comments and questions they would have, and please write them into the F and A uh, function, uh, not in the chat. The chat is not has not the role today for these uh, functions. It's Q and A or F and A, and I will try to read it and bring it into the discussion. So now, please, Christy, what do you think about um, this perspective? Estonia gets it; the Germans don't get Russian imperialism for the time before but maybe even today. Yes, thank you, Christoph, and uh, thank you to the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for, for bringing us uh, together. This is indeed an intriguing and very, very timely question. Um, I would start with this very basic uh, observation that the foreign policy of any country is uh, kind of built on certain assumptions about uh, how international relations work. And these tend to be deep-seated and they change uh, slowly. And uh, these ideas are shaped by the historical experience of uh, countries and also of generations uh, of decision makers who are in power. And in the case of Estonia, my generation, uh, and I'm about uh, the same age as our prime minister, Kaya Kalas, is old enough uh, to remember how it was to live under Soviet occupation. You know, we, we remember the lack of uh, freedom. We, re we remember the atmosphere of fear. We remember the kind of economic uh, misery. And we remember how much we had this longing to uh, regain independence. And at the same time, we are young enough not to have played a role in the Soviet system, but our youth uh, was, was a, a time when 
uh, we lived uh, this very radical change and, and uh, the re-establishment of uh, independence. And this, I think, gives to us um, an interesting mix of realism and idealism in how we see the world. I mean, we know things can be really bad uh, because of our childhood memories. We have this built-in critical approach to Russia and we were observing Russia much more critically through the 1990s and 2000s when uh, the Western attitudes tended to be much more kind of uh, positive and idealistic. But at the same time, we also believe that a big change for the better is possible and small states can also have their opportunities. And the fact that you live in the neighborhood of an aggressive uh, imperialist uh, country that has been imperialist uh, for most of its uh, history, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you cannot be free and independent and sovereign. And, and uh, what we were hearing often in the 1990s uh, from the West was that uh, you should be more cautious not to provoke Russia, you know, and with restoring your independence. And when we were on the way to NATO membership, and we, we often, often heard this uh, warning. But I have to say, if we had been afraid not to provoke Russia in the late uh, 1980s and 1990s, we would probably not have independence and uh, the level of security and, and welfare that uh, we are uh, enjoying in the Baltic countries today. But then we look at Germany and Germany has a very different experience of uh, like recent history, which uh, I think explains also why Germany has been so idealist and uh, in many ways uh, naive in, in its uh, relationship to Russia. And, and uh, I would just kind of uh, highlight um, three ideas or assumptions uh, that have been very important in, in, in German Russia policy, which um, in the Baltic states we have always kind of viewed critically. And now they are actually brought into question in Germany and, and in, more broadly in the West. The first is this idea that economic interdependence with Russia is something that can um, bring you more security, that can help build good political relations. It's something positive to be pursued. And now Germany is in this deep dependence on Russian energy um, and really struggling to, to uh, get rid of it and only now recognizing that it does indeed um, bring uh, vulnerability uh, and it weakens your security. Uh, the second idea is, is uh, that um, Germany for many years was um, thinking that it's, it's very bad to bring more military force closer to the Russian borders, to, to expand NATO, to, to uh, move uh, NATO's uh, presence uh, to um, the Eastern uh, allies. And, and uh, even after 2014, uh, when the NATO policy on this issue started to, to change, Germany was quite reluctant to, to go along with increasing uh, NATO presence in the Baltics. And, and the thinking of Germany was that uh, this is bad for stability, this is provoking Russia, this creates tensions. Whereas in the Baltics, our experience has always been that when we have strong, credible defense, then we can actually have more stability because it works as a deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And the third uh, idea is, is this mantra we have often heard uh, in Germany that we can only have security in Europe with Russia. Well, our historical experience rather tells us the contrary, that we can have security when we are independent from Russia and we, when we have the proper credible defense and deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And uh, this is something I think um, that is difficult uh, even today for, for many people in Western Europe to get used to this idea that for the time being, 
as long as we have Putin in power. This is not the time to try to normalize relations with Russia, and we just don't have a common understanding of European security architecture. We have to somehow learn to live next to Russia as an adversary. And I will stop here with my introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's good that you lined out uh, three main uh, fields, uh, and we will get back to you after we have heard the perspective of Edward and, and Liana. Um, Edward, what is your take? And if I just may add um, an angle, uh, this uh, Christy told us three examples, structural examples. Um, one could also bring in the timeline, whether a certain Russia policy to a certain moment is still understandable, but after an event like 2014 shouldn't be continued, but Germany continued. So what are your thoughts? Is it more timeline? Is it more certain fields? And what, from your perspective, Germany does not get and others get? Well, first of all, I want to say that I endorse, um, I think, literally every word of what Kirsty uh, said from, from Estonia. And I don't want to repeat, my, re repeat what she said, but um, I, I, I agree with that. I think the, the, the first question we have to deal with here is whether there's something particular about Germany, which is different from other, other countries of what one might call the Old West. And I think that the mixture of ignorance, arrogance, complacency and greed, which is exemplified in the German approach to Eastern Europe and Russia, um, is also present elsewhere. We see it in um, the behaviour in past years of, of my country, of the United Kingdom, of, um, of Italy, of France. So it's not a particularity um, that Germany has taken this attitude of ob obsessing about the importance of good relations with Russia for a mixture of reasons, mostly bad ones, and underestimating the importance of the countries in between Germany and Russia. Um, but I do think that there are, there's a particular historical context and that this has uh, led to a particularly intense form um, of this, to my mind, pernicious approach. And it also matters particularly because Germany is so big. If Luxembourg had a very bad policy towards Russia, um, we could live with it because um, Germany has systematically made these enormous mistakes um, over a period of many years, it has severe, even catastrophic effects on uh, all of the rest of Europe. I think this it's, it's perhaps not quite right to say Russian imperialism because it goes back to Soviet imperialism. And the, the danger of a, of a German Zonderweg particular attitude to Russia, I suppose, really dates back to Rapallo, which, um, although seen as uh, very good, bit of diplomacy in some quarters has seen as very bad bit of diplomacy in, in others. And we need to sort of think ourselves back into the world of the, the 1920s, where Poland was trying very hard to build the intermaria, the sort of cordon sanitaire of countries that all had their own sovereignty and statehood, political, economic and other orientation. Um, and this was to stretch from the Baltics to the Black Sea. And you also had this idea, the, competing idea, at least in critic size, um, that the best way to run Europe was a sort of German um, Russian, or in those days Soviet Russian, condominium, where the big countries, both of which had reasons to dislike the Brits and the French, and to some extent the Americans, would um, try and sort things out uh, between them. And this goes on through um, perhaps reaching a peak with the molotov ribbentrop Pact, um, which is perhaps not as remembered uh, as clearly um, among all Germans as it should be, but is remembered with um, blistering, miserable clarity um, by the countries whose um, fortunes were so affected by it. And then we saw it again during the, um, during the, the Cold War, where there was a desire to have a... Um, to normalise relations with Russia and to some extent also with, with Eastern Europe and perhaps the, uh, the uh, Willy Brandt's visit to Warsaw and the famous um, genuflection, the Kniefile, there uh, marked a high point of, of attempts by Germany to reconcile itself with countries in um, Eastern Europe that, whose boundaries now included um, former historic German territories. Um, but that, I think, was overlaid by a much greater focus on 
for example, the importance of getting Soviet gas. Uh, we think Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 are, are recent problems, but actually I, I was covering West Germany in the 1980s, and I remember the extremely strong attempts that the Reagan administration made to warn West Germany against building um, dependence on, in those days, Soviet gas. And then, of course, then the war comes down, and that's where things move into a much higher gear. And I think that the it was it was really striking to me that Helmut Kohl never made a bilateral visit to the Baltic states. He only went there um, very occasionally and always for multi I think once for a multilateral conference. And all the things that Kirsty has said were um, it's it, true, true and painful in in those days. But I think the the, the new element that became more important was greed, um, the idea that. Um, Russia was not only the source of cheap gas, hence Nord Stream 1 and then Nord Stream 2, um, but also as it was a um, land of the future um, in terms of exports. Now, that's also um, proved, I think, illusory largely that Russia didn't meet the um, hopes that some people placed in it. But the, the Ostausschuss, the Committee for Eastern Business, was like an enormous black hole exerting um, largely invisible but very powerful political um, uh, influence in German um, in German politics. And then added to this was the other element of guilt, the idea that the, um, the, the, the Second World War was the defining moment in um, Germany, Germany's moral um, collapse. And therefore, if you were worried about um, everything that's happened in the Nazi period, then the best way of getting around that was to was was to take the opportunity to be really friendly to a supposedly democratic Russia. And this well, started. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I would uh, rather um, get the introductory comments a little bit yeah. more. So, so I'm sorry. Well, that, that's basically what I have to say. So I think that Ger Germany is. Um, is crippled by a, a feeling of guilt towards uh, towards Russia, and there's a very strong element of self-interest, and those two things together, um, and Germany's size, mean these things really matter, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Edward. So, Liana, for, for us Germans, um, this is, our, of course, a little bit painful to hear, but of course, uh, to a certain degree, we probably recognize ourselves in this uh, criticism. So what is, what is your take? Uh, what uh, role plays history, experience, a different experience, uh, at least West Germans had uh, during the Cold War, the economic thing, ignorance and arrogance of a greater power when they discuss with uh, smaller nations and so on and so on. Liana. Thanks so much, and thank you all for the invitation with this great group of discussants. Um, I'm certainly the wrong person to defend Germany in this group, but I do think I can perhaps bring a little bit um, further nuance in the um, sort of uh, discussion about Germany. And I would also place a special emphasis on what is lacking in Germany's response right now. So, I mean, we might look back in the past, but we should also think about what are exactly the concerns and also the demands that one could have nowadays towards Germany and towards its role in the Ukraine war. Two quick points on history, because I think that's important. I think it would be too broad, sort of using too broad of a brush to say that, you know, this whole German-Russian history dates back and is, has always been a history of um, great power Germany trying to get along with great power Russia. I do think there are some important nuance, and I think a helpful concept to understand this nuance is um, the idea of spheres of influence. Because if you look at Germany's history in the 20th century, the first half of Germany's um, history was trying to impose a sphere of influence in Europe on other countries, whereas the second part of Germany's history was being divided and the eastern part of Germany being part of the Soviet sphere of influence at that time. So from this history and this perspective, we have two contradicting term conclusions, basically. The first one is spheres of influence should never return to Europe. And you will see this line and this narrative in Merkel's most important speeches in 2014 after the annexation of Crimea, but also in Olaf Scholz's most important speech on February 27th. It's about the return of spheres of influence. And this again relates to Germany's path that I just said. But at the same time, the other sort of long-term trend in Germany's history, at least after the fall of the wall, was historical reconciliation with Russia. 
and historical reconciliation with Russia stood in contrast to this idea that spheres of influence should not return and for a long time trumped and um, it was one of the reasons why Germany did not act strongly enough against Russian efforts to re-establish a sphere of influence because the idea of historical reconciliation with Russia um, stood in, in contrast to it. One crucial point I still think is 2014. And despite all criticism towards Angela Merkel and her policy, I think we do have to acknowledge that in 2014, she had a crucial role in bringing the European Union together on sanctions policy, um, on crisis management. And one can certainly criticize the Minsk agreements and what they've become later. But at that point in time, it stopped the fighting and I think the main criticism really is that there was never a plan B developed. What if the Minsk agreements do not work? So um, if anyone has followed Merkel's appearance in German public um, at a Berlin theater a couple of weeks or months ago, she said herself that the Minsk agreements were um, even a year before the invasion. She knew that the Russian president was not interested anymore in these agreements. So the logical question from there would be, why was there no plan B, such as um, supporting Ukraine militarily if the Minsk agreements were not valid? But let's remind us that 2014 was the point where Germany's Russia policy took a turn um, with the most important argument, obviously, that Nord Stream 2 remained in place. And that's the longest lasting risk of German policy that energy relations have a stabilizing effect. This brings me to the question of what is lacking in Germany's response right now? I think the first point, which is, yeah, which is a concern, at least to me, is that there is a difference between Germany's and France's response to the war in Ukraine and, from my perception, Poland's and the Baltic response to the war. And Christy might say more about this, but I think it really is about the existential feeling of the war. For the Baltic states and, the Pol and Poland, this war is about their own security. It is about the security of their own ter territory. For Germany and France, it is a war which puts into question the European security order, but is not fundamentally an existential, existential challenge to their own countries. And I do think this explains why we do see a difference in response. And if you look, for instance, at the GDP, how much certain countries have spent in relation to the GDP, in this crisis, it's fascinating to see that Poland and most of the Baltic states are far ahead of Germany and France, which, which are at around 0.2%. And this sort of whiff that I see concerns me because I have the impression that it's not acknowledged enough what the long-term consequences of this different perceptions could be. Um, and my question would be to the audience, but also to my other fellow speakers, sort of based on Germany's reaction now in 2022 in this war, would there be a feeling that one can rely on Germany and one can trust Germany to be there for European security, even if at some point, perhaps the United States will not be as committed as they've been before. So is there real, is there enough trust in Germany's and France commitment um, if the United States as the big leader in this war um, might, yeah, might, might disappear at some point. The second point is certainly that um, there was no strategic aim in Germany's support for um, Ukraine. There's no strategic goal, which makes it difficult to tie weapon deliveries to a certain specific goal. So weapon deliveries come to Ukraine eclectically after a lot of long internal discussions. And they are, I mean, even right now, one could think about what would be necessary in six months and prepare those um, those deployments, which is not taking place. So those are very ad hoc uh, deliveries, which are not following the strategic aim, for instance, of pushing Russia back to the pre-invasion lines. And last, and that's what I've alluded to before, is that Germany in the energy realm really has positioned itself in a way where it is entirely dependent on this reaction and where the entire European Union is not able to use the leverage that it has towards Russia for instance, with a price cap or tariffs, as it was discussed, um, but instead really waits what happens and how Russia reacts. 
So Germany's weakness on gas um, and dependency on Russian gas prevents that the European Union can use Russia's dependency on the European gas market as a leverage. And I think this is um, a third problem of Germany's current approach um, towards the war. And I will leave it there for the moment. Thank you, Liana. I would like to continue on, on that path because that was also the, uh, we have heard it is uh, important which uh, perception of history a country, a society has, what uh, lessons they want to draw, that this is uh, something uh, very difficult uh, to change. On the other hand, where are we in this learning curve? Uh, Patrick asks the question, how can we expect a different German policy if the same policy makers which the same biographical experience are still in place. I mean, the guy who is today the advisor of the chancellor has a long history in German foreign service. And uh, th that would be one line. But the other line, the other side of the picture would be if I take uh, uh, Christie's points uh, from the uh, beginning, and nobody would say today that economic interdependence with Russia is the thing that works. Um, if we come to the military presence, Germany clearly has changed there uh, something. One can ask whether it's enough uh, or not, but certainly it is a change in the in the position. Security only with Russia, yeah, some German political forces still maintain that, but uh, it is no longer a line everybody would um, would applaud. And when it comes to the question, how do we see Russia versus how do we see Ukraine? I mean. Before this war, there was only Russia on our horizon. And nobody talked about, almost nobody talked about the victims of the Second World War in Ukraine, which were in percentage wise, many more uh, than uh, the Russians, uh, the ethnic Russians in, this, in the Soviet Union. So could you please ex assess every one of you, but rather a one to two minute answer, not a five minute answer, otherwise uh, we don't manage with our time. Pick, pick a point to assess to which degree has Germany changed or not changed? Uh, Christy, what would you mention? And do, do you see in your interaction with, with German policymakers, do they have a di different approach today than they used to have two, three years ago or, or not so much? I do see a radical change, but... Um, Changes of uh, like fundamental beliefs about uh, uh, about how the world works, about how the German-Russian relations uh, work or should work, they don't change overnight. So what we have seen in the case of Germany was this big shock on the 24th of February, which um, led to this uh, surprisingly rapid reassessment, but then. After that, after that uh, we have seen a lot of hesitation and that's where we still are today. And we are very closely following it in the Baltic States and Poland and Ukraine because for the future of European security, this is really crucial what kind of role Germany will take and will it actually implement this Zeitenwende that uh, it has kind of suggested and uh, it, it does recognize that it needs it, but it's painful and it's uh, not coming as fast as we might have expected. And, and since uh, Liana lined out that for Estonia in general, the Baltic states, this is much more an existential question than for France, Italy or Germany. Um, do you feel more secure? And if so, because of Europe or because of the United States? Well, one thing that um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has, I think, shown once again, and in the Baltics, we didn't need really to be convinced about it, is the indis indispensable role of the United States in European security still today. And this, this remains. Um, and and uh, when it comes to us seeing the war in Ukraine as an existential issue for us, Yes, uh, that's uh, very much true. At the same time, it's somewhat paradoxical that our security, I would say, in the Nordic Baltic region today is actually 
um, in a better situation than it has been over many years. And for different reasons, I probably don't have time to go into yeah. detail. So it's not that we are afraid of an imminent invasion, yeah. but we see that it is crucial for our future security for coming years and even decades that uh, Ukraine wins this war. Mm -hmm. And just for, for, those, uh, for those in the audience who don't have the, the geographical map uh, in front of them, uh, I just mentioned one point. Um, when now uh, Sweden and Finland are NATO members, the ring of defense for the Baltic countries is finally closed. It's not longer an appendix north of the Suwalki gap, the so-called. They are now in the north and in the south, uh, they have neighbors uh, which are members of NATO. Uh, Edward, your assessment, uh, please. To which degree do you do you see a change in the German approach? Was it a shock? To which degree do you believe in Zeitenwende, or is it just too little, too late, and still a lot of just mouth service and lip service, and not um, not substance? Well, I think that it is a huge shift, and it's also not nearly enough, and there's a paradox got 30 years policy and now it's very difficult um <clears throat> we see it with um on the energy front um particularly um but the german armed forces are in a lamentable state and not able you know you can start throwing money at them but throwing money doesn't create capability or readiness um so i think that there's Uh, I mean, the, the, the rhetoric is 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 very welcome. I very much uh, appreciated Chancellor Scholz's speech. But getting back to your earlier point, um, there's the question of trust, and trust is about two things: trust is about intent, and trust is about effectiveness. Um, do I trust you to want to do the right thing, and do I trust that you will actually be able to do it? I think we've got more, um, perhaps. I would say not perhaps more trust, but less mistrust of Germany now since the start of the war, that people see also the huge response of German civil society in looking after Ukrainian refugees, which is absolutely commendable. Um, but there's still a, a big question about whether Germany, when push comes to shove, will actually be able to do what it needs to do. Can it survive a winter with no Russian gas? What's going to happen then? Um, and also, um, picking up on uh, Christie's point, the, um, the the question of the United States may not be the United States may not be there for us after 2024 if we get another President Trump, perhaps without the safety rails that we had last time, or if we have political chaos following a particular contested election. So we may see a, a, a really the most dramatic and rocky period in European security since. Um, and uncertain since the 1920s. And that's going to require very strong positive contribution from the big countries, Britain, France, and Germany, to fix that problem. And I'm not sure that, that any of those three big countries is in, is in the state to do it right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Liana, you started already a little bit the assessment in your introductory uh, remarks to which degree Germany has changed as it came as a shock. Uh, but uh, I would uh, invite you to, to reply or to, to give your comments uh, on what you have heard from uh, Christy and uh, Liana. But also, I would like to add one thing, uh, because the questions are coming in uh, in, in our Q&A um, function. And, and one is an interesting remark. Uh, one person asks whether Germans are more afraid of Russia than, let's say, the Estonians or the Baltics. Uh, for example, we discuss very much at the moment the dangers of a nuclear power plant, which might be military attack, or we discuss the danger of a nuclear strike. It must, must not be the, the huge thing, but a tactical nuclear weapon launched uh, by, by Putin. And when you said, well, you know, for us, uh, it is not the same ex existential threat, It sounds a little bit like a contradiction that uh, Germans seem to be more afraid about the developments and escalations than countries closer by. But I don't want to um, uh, to ask you not to give uh, your answers to the comments you have heard. It's just an additional point. 
Well, thanks so much. I mean, perhaps two quick points on two domestic issues. Um, the first, you asked the question, how can the same people who have been in charge in the past steer another policy? And I mean, obviously, there's always a human capacity for learning and adapting, which is certainly there. But what I do find interesting that we have new players in Berlin who are coming to power, um, which are the Greens. I mean, they have always been almost the only party in the German parliament that had a clear idea of Russia and Russia policy. Um, they've been opposed to Nord Stream 2, and they are now in the government um, in crucial positions, as we all know, and the perspective for them remains to stay one of the key parties in, future, in, in Germany's future foreign policy. So I do think we see a generational shift and also a political shift in, in Berlin. The second question is, um, and it relates to, to what Christy said at the beginning, the initial shock and then some arguments in Germany um, perhaps returned. I do think that the narratives of those who have been um, we would probably call this in Germany, the Putin Verstehr, those who understand the Russian president, that the narrative of those people has changed. So before the war, it was a narrative of, well, NATO is provoking Russia and so on. The war has made it almost impossible to continue these narratives. Some do, but they are less convincing. So the narrative shifts to two alternative narratives and, uh, narratives. and the alternative narratives are, we need peace, why don't we work towards a ceasefire in Ukraine, peace above everything, um, which would be obviously a very different kind of peace um, that, that we would see. It would be basically yeah, a capitulation of Ukraine, but that's a narrative um, that has become very strong. And the other narrative is exactly the one that you mentioned, that we should prevent um, World War III and a nuclear escalation. And so these, those people have um, wandered <laughs> to different fields, but the intention behind that is still the same. Um, the intention is to say, well, in the end, investing so much in the, the defense of Ukraine is to our own detriment, and it hurts us more than it hurts Russia, an argument that was also made when it comes to European sanctions policy. Obviously, this is not true. I mean, sanctions do hurt Russia much more than they hurt us. But if we look at this upcoming winter in Germany, I think, I mean, obviously Germany will survive this winter. Industry can adapt, households can save. But the question is at what political costs? Because um, the real question would be what are the price and the bills that households in Germany will get until the end of the year. And I think this is not to be underestimated, firstly, because we there's no clear communication so far from the government on these costs, which can mean that uh, normal rent in Berlin suddenly increases by 25%. Um, and also um, that there's no uh, clear perspective um, on uh, what will be the social, uh, if there will be any efforts by the German government to help those that I need to uh, cover these bills. And I think this mixture can lead, can have an influence on the other two debates, on uh, the debate, why do we need peace uh, in quotation marks in Ukraine, why do we need a ceasefire? And um, shouldn't we risk nuclear escalation with Russia? And I think this is a mixture which could become difficult um, and which could challenge the government, which will in no way reopen Nord Stream 2, or not reopen, it has never been opened, but open Nord Stream 2, this is not going to happen. But there might be stronger arguments from some part of the public um, after uh, towards the end of the year. So I'm still quite optimistic, um, but I would also not underestimate the domestic challenge that the German government will face this autumn and winter. Thanks. Since many questions uh, are coming in, I would now propose that I read some of the questions to you, and then I would give each of you the chance to answer one of those questions. It's not that every one of you has to comment on every question that would not possibly in, in means of time, but, but please uh, choose one of these things. Um, I assume it's Chantal Christine Goetz, that it is a French um, first name. Um, she has several uh, questions. One, one was, of course, um, what um, since when was Germany free to um, increase the defense spending? Well, free to increase the uh, defense spending, at least uh, when we became sovereign and unified Germany, but we were not willing to increase our defense spending at a time when other countries 
we're doing already two uh, percent. But there, I would last ask you a comment on Germany's defense spending or Chantal is asking for it. She is also asking um, about the role of the EU, whether combined EU forces could do um, a better job. Magda Schirm is asking whether I agree with a war plane, a war plan where Germany could do more to help them to meet that war plan. And Thomas Schneider was asking about the role of us policy. policy making. You all know that uh, it is famous from the 1970s that the Germans thought that they do this uh, US, US politic. But I think the understanding has changed very much in 2014 when forces in the SPD talked about the US politics. They talked only about uh, diplomacy with Russia, not about the other part. That's the first part of German US politics in the 1970s. We spent 4% uh, of our GDP for defense at that time. So it was coming from a very strong military position and uh, not from a weak position. So, Christy, um, what would you like to, where would you like to start? Rather, the defense uh, or the German policy? What can the EU do uh, by combining forces? Is there a war plan of Ukraine? Germany could do more. But there was actually also a question on the threat of nuclear escalation, and Liana also raised that. And, okay. and that's what I would like to pick up first, and let's see if I have time for, for the other ones. Because this is really a huge issue. And um, again, it's kind of a paradox that uh, in the Baltic states and Poland, we tend to be less afraid of nuclear escalation than uh, people in Germany. And um, what I see uh, in this debate is that um, Russia has been very skillful at um, creating fear among uh, Western publics by threatening with use of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, the more Russia sees that it, it is actually able to create such fear, the more it kind of manipulates it and, and uh, further increases this uh, narrative. Now, as a security expert, of course, I cannot say, no expert can say for sure that Russia will not ever use nuclear weapon in any way in, in this war. We can't completely exclude it. But I think the worst kind of reaction is to, to show fear and to kind of let it paralyze us. And I don't think it makes any sense to kind of put limits on Western military assistance to Ukraine because of our fear of nuclear escalation. Rather, the right response is to, as NATO has been doing, to pay more attention again to nuclear deterrence, stay calm. Russia knows that it cannot actually achieve its uh, strategic aims by going nuclear. It knows that even a very limited use of tactical nuclear weapons would provoke a strong response from the West, and it knows that the West also has nuclear weapons. So it's, it's very, very unlikely that Russia would actually go for a total self-destruction uh, option, even if uh, things are not going in Ukraine the way it would uh, like. Thank you. And that was, of course, uh, the question of Ulrich Schilling, which I also tried to introduce to Liana uh, before. But I think it's an important point and uh, psychologically uh, and so very important. And I understand your, your line would rather be, well, the decision is, in the end, Putin's decision whether he uses nuclear weapons. We can't influence it, and, but we shouldn't be uh, blackmailed uh, by, uh, by the fear he imposes on us. And Edward, which, which of the questions would you like to answer? German defense um, uh, policy, combining European uh, forces, the role of German politics uh, in the thinking and maybe botching up, as Patrick told it, of uh, today's Russia policy. Edward, are you frozen? Or do you hear us? Otherwise, I would first go to Liana, and when Edward is again with us, um, we get back to him. Diana? Yes, happy to jump in. I mean, those are those are a couple of questions. Um, let me. You don't up. have to answer all of them. Just pick yeah. one, two. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine to pick one. I think the one was also in, in the chat has Ukraine, a strategic war plan, which could have plan, yeah. uh, German sure military support. That. Exactly, yeah. That's a question I wanted to pick up because it relates to the point that I've made before, that there's no strategic goal agreed upon to which weapon deliveries are tied. Um, at least sort of not from the not from the European and not from the German side, the US is acting much more strategically with their weapon supplies as we've seen in the past. But there was this um, yeah, weird situation in Germany where at least the top leadership, by which I mean the chancellor, is not saying outright that Ukraine should win this war, but rather suggests that Russia should not win this war and Ukraine should not lose. And that gives the, at least conveys the impression that um, uh, there was a scope of uh, possible scenarios that Berlin could imagine how this war could end, <laughs> including a negotiated solution, um, obviously by uh, led by Ukraine. Um, but it's different to the uh, to the narrative and to the talking points, for instance, from Poland, where it's very explicit: Ukraine must win, and it. Yes, I think also from the Baltic states. And this um, leaves room for doubt. Um, and again, that's why it is so important to uh, clarify the goal. And the goal should be very clearly, very clearly to push Russia back as close as possible to the pre-invasion line. And I think this is a goal which um, uh, should be agreeable among all allies um, and a goal where the weapon deliveries, the scope, the time, and the strategy of weapon deliveries um, should, be, should be linked to. Um, yeah, I've heard different arguments why this is not, uh, yeah, why, why this is not, as explicitly made by the German leadership as it's in other parts of Europe, but we, we can discuss this later. Yeah, but let um, me follow up just with, with one uh, uh, more detailed question on that. I mean, in the beginning, um, the West was delivering to Ukraine mainly former Soviet weapons with the argument, you know, they know how to use them, we don't have to train them. But some people said also, yeah, they don't want to arm uh, Ukraine to a degree where they would be in a position to attack Russia. In the meantime, uh, this, this line has been overjumped. And we know that very modern US weapons, the famous HIMARS, are given to Ukraine and they are very effective. Germany is under pressure to give even more uh, tanks, whether it's special um, tanks or, or just the Leopard, uh, the, the normal fighting uh, uh, vehicle, which is also a very effective uh, vehicle. So do you see here a change that up accommodates more uh, Ukrainian um, wishes and has also um, effect on the battlefield, or is here Germany still very reluctant to follow uh, the US example? Well, I mean, I think Germany is, for instance, also sending the Mars multiple rocket launchers. So, so there's some equipment which is really useful, but the problem is that there are some wet lines which are still there. For instance, there's a wet line on Western-made modern battle tanks. So far, no one is, you know, the discussion about Leopold's. And this, again, if we look at the, how the weapon deliveries have developed since the beginning of the war, one might reasonably assume that Ukraine will need Western-made battle tanks in, let's perhaps say, half a year. So it would seem reasonable to prepare for those already now so that in case they're necessary, one has not to start from scratch and to repair to prepare um, everything that one has, which means that it takes another three months or half a year until those can be um, delivered. And that's sort of the strategic planning that I think which is um, still missing. I think one interesting development is obviously the Ukraine's um, attack, I mean, not officially, but implicitly uh, confirmed on Crimea. Um, and the question if this is sort of the starting point for an offensive in the south, or if this is the starting point for um, uh, an attack on, 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 the, on the bridge um, linking Crimea to Russia. I think it's an interesting shift um, because in the past it seemed that uh, Ukraine was not able to reach Crimea and now for the first time it is, which is not only a symbolically an important symbol, but also politically and military a change in, in, in the course of the war. Uh, Edward, I think you are now again with us and um, we are coming almost already to the final round, but I would like to enlarge the whole picture. Um, the crisis around Taiwan, 
reminds us that uh, Russia is not the only security problem the West faces. And if we just imagine uh, that Asia becomes a much more challenging focus point and the US uh, would have to concentrate on the Pacific rather than on the Atlantic, one of the consequences would be that Europe has to be much more able with no or at least less US help to manage uh, the security challenges with Russia. And so it's not only the question to which degree Germany has learned, but also Europe, uh, Western Europe or Central and Western Europe has learned. I still remember the Balkan Wars and the, uh, the holy pledges uh, that Europe understood the lesson at that time. What a shame that we couldn't end the Balkan Wars without the help of the United States and Germany will step up to the plate. And when the next conflict come, we will be able to solve such a problem on, with our European forces and without being dependent on the military forces of the United States. I can't see that that would be assessment of today, that uh, Europe is able to manage uh, security problems um, with Russia without the help um, of the United States. But we might be forced into such a situation if we have a double war theater in the Pacific and in the Atlantic at the same time or in Europe and, and Asia. Uh, Edward, to which degree, what, 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 what you are your thoughts? Because people here ask about um, the effect of a combined um, EU uh, approach in such a conflict. Where, where are we and what lessons did, did the European Union has learned lessons or is it also rather a bystander? Your mic is not on, please, please, uh, Edward. Yeah, sorry, um, the, the European Union has woken up um, slowly to the idea that it has a serious problem with China. And we're all looking forward with interest, if not a great deal of optimism, to the German government's China strategy when that comes out later this year. I think that the EU, as the world's largest trading bloc, is in a very important position for negotiating with China, even though China's a long way away. Um, China can't pick on the EU the way it can pick on, um, say, Australia. Um, well, I do think that... Well, I'm afraid... Please, go on. Yeah, well, I don't think it's funny. And we should not be lying about Lithuania. We should be um, asking ourselves why it is the Lithuanians are being dry and the rest of Europe isn't coming to help them. I think this is a really shameful moment in European economic diplomacy that we have a country that's done something which um, other countries have been too scared to do. It's done it, it's being punished, and the rest of Europe largely is sitting by and letting that punishment be executed by China. So if we want to be serious on this, we have to be serious in countering China's economic coercion, and the EU is in a very good position to do that. I also think if we want to keep the United States involved in European security, the best way we can do that is show the, the Americans uh, that we are able to help with their number one priority, which is the Indo-Pacific region. So if we are loyal and effective allies on that, we stand a better chance of keeping the American military involvement in Europe, which we desperately need. Thank you. Christy, how do you experience or assess um, the European uh, factor in, in, this, um, in this challenge uh, uh, situation? To, to which degree is the EU a force to count on? And to which degree is the EU at all united? We get back to the starting point that Eastern European, Eastern Central European, sorry, the Baltics, the Poles, have a different experience and a different reflex when it comes to Russia than the French, the Italians, the Germans, maybe the Spaniards. Uh, how do you experience that? Is, is there something like a common European approach to the Russia security challenge, or is it rather divided by different parts of Europe? Well, what we have uh, seen since the 24th of uh, February is actually the EU becoming much more of a security actor and geopolitical actor than uh, we would have expected. And uh, you can see it in, in uh, many uh, respects, um, the assistance that the EU has mobilized uh, to, to Ukraine, the foreign political and economic support, even making EU instruments uh, available to give military aid to, to Ukraine, which is something uh, uh, 
really uh, quite amazing and new. And uh, the decision to give uh, candidate country status uh, to Ukraine and uh, Moldova, uh, which was also quite a political uh, battle and argument among the member states. But I think in the current uh, geopolitical context, uh, this was exactly the kind of signal that was needed that the EU actually has a clear strategic uh, goal in its relationship to Ukraine. And then there is the energy uh, policy where, of course, the EU's role is really important in, in uh, kind of uh, trying to build solidarity among European countries and, and uh, trying to prepare us to actually survive uh, without uh, Russian uh, gas and oil. So um, I think the EU's role really shouldn't be underestimated. But at the same time, when it comes to military defense, this is still not something that we look to the EU for. And uh, even more today than, uh, let's say, one year ago, because NATO has also strengthened as a result of uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine. It is enlarging and, and uh, it is increasing its uh, presence on the eastern flank. Um, so we have this very clear division of labor also between the EU and uh, NATO. Thank you, Christy. And a last short remark by Liana. How do you see uh, Europe's role versus the US? How, um, how united or not united is Europe in this challenge? Um, very quickly, um, I think the question really is what if um, the elections in the United States lead to a result that we all would not like to see? And what if um, instead of relying and trusting more in Europeans' abilities, mutual abilities to defend each other and to stand up for each other, we will end up in a situation where we focus now even more on NATO, which means to some extent on the US presence in Europe, um, and uh, perhaps neglect that um, the United States is not as reliable as we wish it to be. And I don't want to make predictions, but I do think it is an important um, scenario to consider. And my concern is that through the Ukraine war, we perhaps become even more reliant on the United States as, an, as these indispensable nations, as Christy said, in Europe, and thereby um, sort of the, the, the possibilities how we as Europeans can defend each other um, uh, uh, yeah, not not sufficiently not sufficiently explored. So we may end up in a situation where European unity is there because of US leadership, but once US leadership is gone, European unity might be more difficult to establish. I hope Christy contradicts my <laughs> pessimistic assessment. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, we have not more time to um, reply on that uh, question. Uh, we are rather at, at, at our um, end. And I would uh, just uh, like to elaborate on Liana's um, comment on the US election. Yeah, on this happy note, um, democratic elections are also a huge risk factor. And it's not only the United States, whether it's some guy like uh, Donald Trump might come back. We have elections in Italy, which might lead to a less reliable coalition this autumn, we have Hungary. Um, we also the French election could have gone wrong this spring, and we don't know how it will look in five years from now. So yeah, there, there is a, a huge risk that democracies undermine themselves uh, and uh, will be less able to defend their uh, freedom. Uh, the task Patrick gave us at the beginning is to review the German Russia policy, what went wrong, where uh, things were botched. Um, I think we all agreed that a lot went wrong, but we had also some silver linings that at least uh, the changes into German approach, the learning curve is steep. There have been changes, maybe not, not yet enough, but and some of them too late, but um, there is something uh, changing. And uh, with this, I would like to ask all in the audience to Thank you, Christy Reich, to thank you, Edward Lucas, to thank you, Liana Fix, and to thank uh, the Nauman Foundation for freedom uh, for doing uh, this. I don't know, Patrick, whether you are still there and would uh, also say goodbye uh, to your audience. Uh, otherwise, it is my role to thank you all 
and to wish everybody a healthy um, future and a secure future and a free future because we rely on all these things in a very existential way. Thank you from my side. Uh, Patrick is with us. If you have a last remark, please go on. Otherwise, I say thank you and goodbye. So yes, thank you all very much for this interesting discussion this evening. Um, I really like that the outlook wasn't as bleak as the invitation might have suggested. Still, um, we also heard there's still a lot to be done as the yeah the uh, the threats to global security outside of the Ukraine crisis are even now shaping. So there's um, well. We can't sit on our hands. We can't simply can't afford it. And at least we got um, a wake up call. I hope it was enough and uh, we are doing enough. I forgot at the beginning um, to invite the panel back into a debriefing session after the event. So if you still have the time, please click on your Zoom link. And after we um, switch off this webinar, we will meet again and I will be able to say uh, goodbye once again. And for now, thank you all. Thanks to the audience for listening. It's a very, very nice uh, August evening. And uh, see you soon in another web talk or even live in person. That's a thing that's coming back at least until uh, the winter time, I guess. So thanks a lot again. And um, let's see where the next steps will take Europe and Germany um, in this decade. So.